morning that God has allowed us to all come together. And we just thank him for just waking us up this morning. We pray that you have been blessed thus far in our worship service with the teaching of God's word and life application with Brother Shelley. And I pray that you all are taking good notes so that you can feast on the word of God. I know that I've been made stronger, I've been strengthened, and I pray that you have too. Also, let me remind us once again, I know that um, it seems as if we are comfortable in what we are doing and undertaking, but it is extremely important that um, we be a blessing to others. So I'm encouraging you to wear your mask and to continue to social distance yourself and just be mindful that we are required and responsible for doing our part. That is extremely important. And to our members, if there are any problems and issues that may occur, you are welcome to give us a call uh, here at the church at 423-622-2077. And also let me uh, say thanks to those of you who um, see such a need to continue to give. That is extremely important. Uh, I'm only standing here because of you. And so I say thank you. You may drop your tithes and your offerings off here at the church uh, on today, Sunday, from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. Or you may come by the church Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. And if you choose not to do any of that, you are welcome to use our Givelify app. What I do want you to be mindful of is that I just want to remind you that God loves a cheerful giver. I do encourage all of us to uh, continue praying for one another. I know we cannot uh, necessarily fellowship and see each other as we uh, once have done in the past, but it is extremely important that we all understand and know that prayer works no matter where you are, what location, whatever the situation might be. So, just be mindful of, of those things, and uh, I pray that as we do that, that we will do our part. So thank you so very, very much for your cooperation. And all you have to do now is just flip your page over in your book, uh, get your Bibles, which I know you've already had from Life Application, and we are going to move forward and continue what study we have been focusing on. But before we do that, I'm going to ask that we would read our prayer of meditation together. And it simply reads, Dear Lord, I come before thee as an empty vessel. Open my ears that I might hear. Open my eyes that I might see. Open my mind that I might understand. Open my heart that I may receive your word. Amen. First of all, we are still dealing with our theme entitled, uh, Ain't No Need to Worry, taken from Paul's writings out of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Um, what I would like to do is just simply back up just enough in the major thought pattern of what Paul has been dealing with um, in the section that we have uh, been undertaking for the last two Sundays, we are right in that category of Paul's writings uh, in Philippians chapter 4. And we have locked in the thought uh, from verse uh, 10 uh, up to 14 we covered, uh, up to 13 we covered. And it is in that whole section from that point on that we have been talking about the secret of contentment. The secret of contentment. And um, before we uh, go any further, I want to just kind of rehash uh, that section so that we can connect it with what Paul is getting ready to deal with in regards to our study on today. The secret of contentment. Now, we have already dealt with verse 10 of our text, and it is here that we talked about the contentment in God's providence, 
the contentment in God's providence. And then in verse 11, we dealt with the thought, content with a little. Content with a little. And then we moved on to verse number 12, where we talked about a contented person is independent from circumstances. Independent from circumstances. And then in verse 13, we talked about a contented person is strengthened by divine power. Strengthened by divine power. And what we want to do today is continue in that same vein of Paul talking to us about the secret of contentment. And let us make sure that we don't lose sight of what we've already discussed so that we can better grasp what Paul is going to deal with us on today. Now keep in mind that the Apostle Paul has just, on those verses, he has just finished giving thanks to the Philippians for their giving of him financially. And that is what we talked about in verse 10. He also acknowledged the fact that he wanted to make sure that they understood that he was not necessarily dependent upon their gifts, that the Lord had blessed him uh, unusually and lifted him in a category to where he was able to deal with uh, his circumstances in a way that when he had much or when he had little, Paul understood what to do under both circumstances. And that's what he shares with us from verses 11, 12, and 13. So based on what Paul has already presented to us, Paul was very cautious about some things. He was cautious over the fact that he did not want the Philippians to get the impression that he did not appreciate their gifts. So he quickly, after talking to us in verses 11, um, 12, and 13, he pins now another thought under the idea of the secret of contentment. And he does this by beginning his, his presentation with verse 14. Now, what I want us to keep in mind is Paul was very grateful. He was gracious. He was kind. He accepted what the Philippians offered unto him. And based on that, what Paul is getting ready now to share with us is on this thought. And that is, he's going to talk to us about the cooperation of the Christian life. The cooperation of the Christian life. And this is what Paul is going to lock in in thought from verse 14 down to 18. Okay? So in these, these few verses, what Paul does is describes different dimensions of these gifts. Keep in mind now that the whole focus of what Paul is dealing with has to do with making sure that the Philippians understood that he was appreciative of what they had given unto him. So in verses 14 down to 18, we we'll kind of break it down like this. First, Paul's focuses on, is based on to himself as a recipient. In other words, when we get into this, he's going to talk about him receiving his attitude based on verses 14, 15, and 16. And then secondly, when we get to verse 17, Paul is going to talk about the givers. And then finally, in verse 18 of the text, Paul talks to us about God. 
So that's how Paul kind of lays out his, his, his discussion uh, to the Philippians regarding what they had already given unto him. So in explaining then how Paul had managed to uh, become adjusted to his personal circumstances, once again, he did not want the Philippians to get an attitude or he did not want to come on to them as if he was not appreciative. So listen now um, how he begins his discussion to them here in verse 14. And in verse 14, he just quickly says, and he does just like he, he is as if when his, his spirit speaks to him and says, hold it, hold it, make this correction. And he breaks out and says, nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Okay. Looking then holistically at, at Paul's presentation, going back to making sure we make the connection on the idea that Paul is talking to us about the secret of contentment. Another thought that you might want to keep in mind that within verses 14 down to 18, Paul is going to talk to us about a contented person is preoccupied with the well-being of others. Okay? He is preoccupied with the well-being of others. Now, that's a, a vast thought. So let's break it down as Paul carries us through his discussion. Let's take a look now at verses verse 14 down to 15a. And it is here that Paul says that the reason for his past financial need. Don't lose uh, sight on the idea that Paul is trying to make sure that the Philippians understand he was appreciative. But they had to understand also that there was a, a flip side to what Paul wanted them to grasp. And the text reads, and I know I just read verse 14 for you, but I want to read 14 and 15a. Just listen to what it says. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distresses. Watch it. Now you Philippians... Know also that in the beginning of the gospel. Now here's something that I want you to really pay attention to when it comes to verse 14. Notice it now. The strange thing about verse 14 is that the apostle Paul is not commending the Philippians. That is not what he's doing. Because... He's not commending them because they had met his need. That is not what he's doing. He is commending them simply because they have satisfied a need of their own of which they don't seem at this point to understand it. They're kind of ignorant as to what has actually taken place. So Paul feels that it is his job to step to the plate and make sure that they understand that. So watch now, and let's pay attention to how Paul begins verse 14. Okay? Now, if you have the New King James Version of the Bible, Paul begins that verse with the term, nevertheless. It is also the same term that is used if you have the New American Standard Version. But if you have the King James Version, it states notwithstanding. If you have the New Revised Standard Version, it says in any case. And then finally, if you have the NIV it simply uses one word, yet. Now here's the point. This is what I want you to understand. 
When Paul begins verse 14 with the term, nevertheless, what he's actually doing is he is introducing an important transition in his thought pattern, in his thinking. You got to connect now that Paul is on a mission to make certain that the Philippians don't become confused. So what he had written in verses 10, 11, 12, and 13 could easily have caused a person to receive the wrong message. And Paul did not want the wrong intent to get out. Okay? So Paul wanted to make sure that these Philippians understood that what they had done for him, he was appreciative. So despite their poverty, okay? Despite their poverty, and we dealt with this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Just write it down. That's all I need you. We had we talked about this previously. They had sent what I call a sacrificial gift. And they did this through their servant, Ephroditus. And we talked about this. And you're going to see this name is going to come up again in the very chapter that we're in, in verse 18. Okay, it's going to come up again. So that word nevertheless is powerful. It makes a contrast between Paul's state of sufficiency. That's what he talked about now in verses 11 down to 13. It was a state of sufficiency. Now he makes the contrast with that state of sufficiency with the fact of generosity coming from the Philippians. And I, I don't want you to get confused. He's taken the statement that he's made in verses 11, 12, and 13 and contrasting that against their generosity. So he doesn't want to sound as though he is not appreciative. Now, to make certain that the Philippians did not misunderstand Paul, listen to the language. Listen to what he says in verse 10, verse 14. Listen to what he says. He says, you have done well. Okay? Right there in the text. You have done done well. First of all, the word well is an adverb. And it is translated from a Greek word which means good. But it can also be translated to mean excellently or nobly. The point that Paul is making is that the Philippians had done far more than all the others who were around them that did nothing. They went over and beyond their call for duty in relation to Paul. And they were demonstrating nothing more than an act of love in their offering unto Paul. And Paul did not want them to forget that. He wanted to make sure and certain that they understood He was appreciative. So he says unto the Philippians, you have done well. Watch the text now. He goes on to say that you shared in my distress. That's what he says. That you shared in my distress. That word distress is also translated in other versions of the Bible into the word affliction. And here's what you will find. You will find that, first of all, it's the same concept, or it is used in Philippians chapter 1, verse 16. Same concept, same thing there. Now here's what he's doing. He's telling us 
And he wants us to understand that this is a very strong and powerful approach. And what it is and the reason why it's there is because if you miss this, you're going to miss pretty much the whole concept of what Paul is is trying to uh, uh, convey to them. It's such a strong word, it has reference to suffering. Suffering due to pressure of circumstances. Okay? And what Paul, what they are literally saying in essence to each other. I like the way the NIV puts it. The NIV makes it very, very practical at this point. The NIV reads it like this. It says, it was good for you to share my troubles. Now listen to what he says. It was good for you to share in my troubles. Based on Paul's statement, there are two. When you look back at this verse, there are two important terms uh, in connections with the contributions that were given unto Paul and what Paul is trying to convey unto them. Two important things stands out. The very first thing that you will find in that statement is that they participated with him. I need you to understand that. They participated with him. Now, how can I prove it? Well, first of all, in research, it implies then that this comes from the concept of fellowship, which means a deep partnership of two going the same direction. They're dealing with the people who were giving and Paul who received. But Paul wants them to understand is deeper than just their giving and his receiving. Listen to the language that he uses in the text. They participated with him. In other words, their concern and their purpose in giving to Paul caused them to feel as though and sense that they were participating with his suffering. Okay? Then the second thing I need you to understand is that when Paul makes mention of this, Paul identified their partnership specifically as with his troubles. In other words, Paul wanted the Philippians to see that he was not just reaching out for what they were giving him. But that in their giving. He takes it. And matches it. And lines it up. With his troubles. In other words. They are where Paul was. And that ought to help us. In understanding. How to give. How to honestly give. You, you got to give. With the attitude that you are where that person is. You have to have the attitude. Just as Paul is teaching and trying to get us to understand. He's receiving what the Philippians have. But at the same time, the Philippians are not just giving. But they're giving based on them connecting with Paul's troubles. Listen to the Apostle Paul. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 24. Who spoke of suffering. Listen to what he says. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. And fill up in my flesh. What is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. For the sake of his body. Which is the church. Again. The whole idea here. Is that. Their giving is connected to Paul's troubles. So in their giving, they are identifying with Paul's troubles. Watch him in the text now. Note what Paul declares, and we're going to connect it all in verse 15a. Listen to what he says. Now you Philippians. Got it? 
Watch him in 15a. Now you Philippians know also that the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia. Now notice now, once again, in verse 15, Paul begins it with one three-level word, now. The word now here makes a transition to his first experience regarding their generosity. Watch the connection now. He's dealing with trying to make sure that the Philippians don't assume he's being harsh or ungrateful. So he says, now, when you think of the idea of the concept of that term now in the text, it is presented like this. But this is no new thing, for you have always been generous. Now you get the picture. What he's saying, he, if, he doesn't want them to park their minds just on this one situation. He wants them to understand he's not just dealing with this present moment that they were giving, but he reaches back. And says, you have always been generous toward me. Then Paul, watch the text now, goes on to declare, now you Philippians know also. Now we got a question that we must put on the table. Why does Paul introduce in the text Philippians again? Look in your Bibles. You should see it right there. Why is this important? This is important because Paul did not often address the churches by name as he does here. Here in our text, Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, he does. Now what you can do is compare that with Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Listen to what he says. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. Our heart is wide open. You see, there was a time then when he did not express what we might call serious or or open earnestness. So what Paul is doing is making sure that the Philippians do not walk away with an attitude. He doesn't want them confused. He wants them to understand that what they have done for him is much deeper than just them thinking that they have given unto Paul. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay? Watch the text. Paul declares, you Philippians know also. Don't you find it strange that Paul says to them, you know also. See, that word know comes from a Greek word that Paul uses throughout his writings. In fact, it is so powerful, you will find it In Philippians chapter 1, verse 17, you'll see it in verse 19, you'll see it in verse 25, and you'll see it also in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. Now, he uses this expression, you Philippians, which in this context is his great love for them, and that's what Paul is sort of speaking a love language and he keeps saying and he keeps pinpointing that he has reference to them. And why? Because he does not. See, the enemy can always find a loophole. The enemy can always find room to to ease in and to do something. Okay. And so Paul constantly is reminding them he doesn't want that to happen. So he's careful in the language that he uses. Let me take you to Philippians chapter 4 verse 1. 
Listen to what he says. Therefore, my beloved and long for brothering. So we can already see that there, there was a, a, a love bond that had been established with Paul and the Philippians. So when Paul does this, he is saying in essence, he has a deep appreciation for them in a contrast totally different than that of the Corinthians, okay? Two opposite groups of people, okay? When it came to the uh, uh, Corinthians, the idea was their attitude of narrowness, okay? Or hearing the word and, and staying stagnant and refusing to change. The Galatians... Their attitude was that of foolishness. But the Philippians, when Paul focuses on them, Paul is more or less talking to them and praising them for their devotedness. Okay? So we, we can understand. And Paul does not want, he does not want to, for them to fall from the level that they're on right now. He wants to make sure that they understand. And Satan is busy. Always busy. So you you, you can be doing a right thing and, and, and think that the person didn't say what you think they should have said. And then you get an attitude and that changes the whole process. So when you look at the text, when Paul said, you Philippians know also, he was reminding them over the fact that they had written to him. They had already written to him about his financial condition. He did not want them to lose sight of that connection. Paul goes on to explain, watch the text now, what they had done shortly after they were saved. Listen to his statement. He declares, in the beginning of the gospel. In the beginning of the gospel. You should see it right there in your Bibles. Paul now took his readers 10 years back. Okay? 10 years. 10 years back to his first preaching. The phrase that you find in your Bibles that simply says the beginning of the gospel refers to the time when Paul had first preached the gospel to them. When the message first began to be an influence in their heart. We can stop right there and pack up and go home. Right there. Because when you know that when you have delivered the word. And the word has, has found a resting place in the hearts of the hearers. You got something going. Because that's the whole purpose. It's not designed for you just to hear and quote. But it's got to sink in to your spirit to bring about change. So the beginning of the gospel refers to Paul's preaching on a tour in Macedonia. And Philippi. So Paul, Paul takes them all the way back. Paul, according to scripture, went into Macedonia where Philippi is located as a result of what we know is a Macedonian call. All of this scripturally recorded, Acts chapter 16, verses 9 and 10. Okay? Acts Chapter 16, now listen to what it says. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So when Paul, going back to our text, departed from Macedonia, was some ten years, ten years before and 
dealing with the historical record of the period given of what you will read in both Acts chapter 17 and Acts chapter 18. So Paul brings all of this before them simply by saying the beginning of the gospel. See, sometimes you have to be reminded of where you got started from, at what point you got started from. Okay? Now watch Paul. In 15b and all of 16, we're going to deal with the relief of, of Paul's present financial need. So you can't lose sight of what Paul is actually saying to them. All of this hangs on the hinges of them understanding the purpose of his gift. His receiving of the gift. He wants them to make sure they got the right attitude. So the first thing that Paul does is this. The lacking concern of the churches. The lacking concern of the churches. Listen to the language that Paul uses. He says, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving. You see, the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit had used the Apostle Paul to establish many churches besides the one at Philippi. Yet, when you look at this sad statement, those churches did not offer Paul assistance. We can stop right there. We, we can stop right there. There's a problem in the body of Christ because it doesn't take much for people to become confused on their purpose in the kingdom of God, in serving, in giving. We, we lose sight of all that. If you were uh, tuned in to life application, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit operates and how he connects lessons. And you get everything. And, and, and this is important. This, no doubt, is why Paul had made the statement that he made to the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 12. Listen to what he says. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you. And are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. It's, it's a sad situation when in the body of Christ, folk get mad and upset and don't want to give. So you, if, if you have that kind of an attitude, you, you really got the wrong connection. Okay? How, how many of us, first of all, how, how many married folk? How many folk dating somebody? If, if you, you wake up every morning, you ain't pleased with yourself sometimes. No less with somebody else. But what you don't do is let petty, uh, stupid, crazy things interfere with with what is the main thing. And that is maintaining relationships. It's amazing. So we pick what we want to stop doing. Then we have the audacity to say. I'm going to hold back. I'm not going to give. Because I don't like Reverend so and so. I don't like Pastor so and so. I don't like this person. You, you're not giving to that person. you giving because of the cause of Christ. You didn't hear what I just read. Notice now that Paul, in the text, does not criticize. He doesn't offer any rebuke. He doesn't seem to have an attitude. He just lifts up the Philippians for what they have done and doesn't say anything about the others who have not done anything. It's right there in your text. 
Okay? Paul knew that they had remembered him. He knew that. And he did not want mess to get started. Because you know it doesn't take but a minute. Okay? Now, notice in the text, you see the words giving and receiving. Let me help you out. Throughout Paul's writings, Paul used a lot of business terms. So what he does here, he brings to the table the bookkeeping concept. Okay? Plain and simple. He is saying, in essence, no other church open an account with me except you. That's the whole thing. In other words, what you have done for me is in the books. And there comes a point, that's the attitude we have to take when we're dealing with giving. You got to know that God deals with what's in the book. Plain and simple. Second thing. Let's lock in now. I know I said 15A and D, B. I, I got a C. And that's the last part. Last couple of little words at the end of verse 15. And all of 16. And it is here that we now need to flip the situation. Because now Paul is going to talk about the living concern of their church. Listen to the verses. Listen to what he says. But you only. So you see that at the end of verse 15. Watch 16. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. So let's back up. Let's back up. Let's look at but you only. Okay. Now. A slight problem. I'm not going to go into detail on it. But it's kind of hard to pinpoint when Paul says, but only you. But on, but you only. That's, that's because scripture does indicate out of the book of Corinthians that there was another church. We're not going to get into that. The point that I want you to pay attention to is that when Paul says, but you only, it means that Paul is only emphasizing the church at Philippi, their congregation, and the attitude is they were consistent givers. Does everybody hear me? They were what? Consistent givers. They only, they were the only Constant partners that were with Paul. Now let me tell you what that teaches us. That tells us that when you're going through something, you need to be connected with somebody that understands where you are and is willing to go with you. See, some of us get delivered and act like we've never been there. And what, what, what Paul, what these Philippians were reminding themselves is that we're going to give you unto you, Paul, but we give him based on your troubles. Why? Because we've been there before. And we understand the importance of us doing our part. So they sent gifts on two different occasions. Look at the language. That Paul has in the text. He says once and again. Once and a what? Again. Whew. Watch this. Now. Paul has expressed. His gratitude. To the Philippians. For their recent. Gifts. Their recent. Financial offering. Now, what Paul is getting ready to do is explain why he was so pleased with the gift. So you got to understand, he doesn't want them thinking that he was chasing their money. 
And this is something that the average Christian uh, can really gain a spiritual lesson. Watch Paul in verse 17. He says, not that I seek the gift. Not that I seek the gift. But I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Now don't lose sight. I told you. Paul uses business language. Okay? So now he says, account. What in the world is Paul talking about? Glad y'all asked me. Paul rejoiced over their future reward. Remember I told you that what they were doing is given to Paul and they didn't really realize that his level of rejoicing wasn't predicated on what he received, but based on what they had done to him. That was going to be something in their account. Okay? Something in their account. So here in verse 17, Paul wanted them to be sure why he was so pleased with their gift. That was his mission. Their gift brought joy. Not because of its personal material benefits. That's not the key here. But because of its spiritual benefit to them. That kind of reminds me when folk give and get mad with the person that they gave to. Maybe the person didn't say thank you. Or the person did something wrong with the money. That's really You ain't got nothing to do with that. Because what I need you to understand is that if you gave right, if if your attitude of giving is right, God puts it in your account. He already knows what you're doing, but he puts it in your account. When Paul moved on to Thessalonica... And to Corinth, he gladly received their report. Let me, let me prove it. Almost about ready to let you go. First Thessalonians chapter 2. You got to hear this. Beginning with verse 3. Listen to Paul. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Watch Paul. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Watch Paul. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetedness. God is witness. Nor did we see glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Mm. So affectionately, longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become what? Dear to us. You had become what? Dear to us. Paul had enough for his needs. God had seen to that. That's what Paul wanted them to connect with. He wasn't saying, I'm not grateful. He wanted them to understand, if you send me a little something, something, fine. But God has blessed me that I can get along with a little or I can get along with much. But if you send it, I need you to know I'm still yet grateful. I hope you don't lose sight of what I'm talking about. But now he desires that they might reap the the reward. What reward? The reward of giving in life to come. See, that was the whole thing in a nutshell. Paul did not want this fruit for himself, but for them. This is the whole. 
How can I prove? Look at the text. He says that what? That may abound to your account. So what is Paul teaching us? When you give, when you honestly give from your heart, God turns around and puts it in your account. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. So you got to be careful. Then he closes his argument. What, what am I talking about? Keep in mind, he rejoiced over that what? Future reward. But then finally, Paul rejoiced over that sacrifice to God. Listen to him in verse 18. He says, indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epiroditus the things sent from you. A sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. How did Paul close his argument? He closed it like this. The apostle now looked at how their gift affected him and God. I want to show you three verbs. And I'm letting you go. Three verbs. You got to see it. Three verbs in the text that impacts Paul's whole deal regarding wanting them to understand that what you've done for me, I'm most appreciative, but I need you to understand if you do it right, God puts it in your account. Listen to what he says. First, a, rec a receive a full payment. Okay? Receive full payment from them for his total investment of time in their lives. All Paul's doing is taking what they hit and put to him. He hitting it right back. But doing it through the power of God. How can I prove it? Look at what the text says. Paul says, I have all. That's, you you got to see it. He says, I have all. So that's, that's the first verb there. I have all. And that is the attitude you have to take sometimes. When dealing with life's troubles and situation, learn to be content when you got a little. Learn to be content when you got much. That's all you got to do. Have the attitude, I have it all. Don't just be joyful when you got money in your pocket. Be joyful when you ain't got a dime to your name. Then secondly, secondly. He actually received more than he expected or deserved. Remember I told you that the Philippians had gone over and beyond? Look at what's in your, in your Bible. He says, I abound. He could not have abound. He abound because he knew that God's going to supply his needs. But at the same time, he wants the Philippians to understand, I got much. I got much, I abound. Then he closes his argument on the thought of simply saying, now was a financial position without any immediate need. How can I prove it? He says, I am full. Look in your Bibles. I have all, I abound, I am full. I have all, I abound, I am full. I have all, I abound, I am full. In other words, Paul saying, my financial cup has overflown. <laughs> That's the secret to contentment. Okay? Now, I, I pray. I, I know we walk through a whole lot, but it's worth it. Trust me. All I want you to understand is that Paul lays out his presentation. He says, I don't want the Philippians to get an attitude that I'm not appreciative. But at the same time, I can't ignore that the God I serve has blessed me in all circumstances. How to be joyful when I ain't got nothing and how to be joyful when my cup is overflowing. And how do you explain to somebody, you can bless me if you want to bless me. But if you don't, I need you to understand I'm still blessed. <laughs> That's the whole attitude. I pray that you've been blessed. If it's God's will, it's God's will. On, on next Sunday, 
we, we want to look at Paul's next statement. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. May God bless you. May God keep you. Stay faithful. Stay focused. And above all, stay connected with God. Let's read our dismissal. Dear Lord, now that we have heard your word, help us to become doers of the word by loving others, caring for the needy, and sharing the gospel. God bless you.